Hey everyone, so it's Hearth and welcome back to my channel. On today's video we're talking about what practical magic got right about witchcraft. <music> Practical Magic is my favourite witchy movie and it's a cult classic for so many others. This year is actually the 25th anniversary of its release and it contains so many big names including Sandra Bullock and Nicole Kidman and if you haven't seen it, please be sure to see it, not only because this video contains spoilers, but also because it is a phenomenally good movie, which wasn't as popular as it should have been when it came out. This film is wonderful, it's whimsical, it's witchy, and a lot of it is based in witchcraft reality. Now, of course, the obvious statement here is that Practical Magic is a movie that's based off a book, and it's not actually a documentary or any kind of real-world information. However, information and inspiration usually comes from somewhere in the real world world. And this book and this movie is really deeply connected to the witchcraft community and so much of what they say is accurate that I felt like I had to include it in a What They Got Right video. The opening sequence shows Maria Owens, the ancestor to all of the Owens women we see later on in this movie, having her sentence for witchcraft carried out. Now I can't go too deeply into the scene because YouTube really won't like it, but immediately it breaks down so many misconceptions that people have around the witch trial period and sets the scene for me. It lets me know that the people who created this movie and probably the book as well, knew what they were talking about and they did their research. Firstly, Maria is not being burned at the stake. She's actually being hanged. Now many people, even practicing witches today, believe that all witches were burned for the crime of witchcraft, and that simply isn't the case. Depending on where you were in the world would change how you were treated. So if you were on the European continent, you were more likely to be burned because it was perceived as heresy. Whereas if you were in England or North America, you were more likely to be hanged because it was more akin to attempted harm rather than heresy. And this goes back to how everything was judged and the different courts and the entire system that was different. But it is one of those misconceptions that we still see perpetuated today. And this movie from 1998 breaks it down immediately. There was also some commentary about why people believed she was accused of witchcraft that I find really interesting. The first aspect was that she had the misfortune of choosing men who were already married and the wives were on the hanging committee and therefore they accused her of witchcraft in order to get rid of her. While this is said in a light-hearted way, it's not that far from the truth. A lot of people who were accused of witchcraft were simply wrong place, wrong time, or they had done something that had frustrated, annoyed, or essentially alarmed anyone in that community. And in some places around the world, it just took a few people to say that you were a witch, and then you were sentenced for witchcraft. We see this in the Pendle Witch Trials in England. A nine-year-old girl accused a group of people of being witches, and they were tried as such. In some cases, all it takes is someone to not like you, put in a bad word about you, and next thing you know, you're being accused of being a witch. It is important though to remember that this is not something that we see all of the time and most of the people that were accused of witchcraft were never actually sentenced, but it is just a funny anecdote that really does tie back to the witch trial period. They then say that ultimately the reason she was accused of witchcraft was because she possessed magic and the local community was scared of her because of it. Even if she didn't do anything with it to harm anyone else, just the fact that she was different and perceived as being more powerful and more significant than the people around her scared everyone, and it meant that she was then accused. Now, during this entire time, she actually escapes her fate, and she is banished to an island with her unborn child, where she sets up a life for herself. Now, while she's there, she casts a spell out into the universe that she will never again feel the agony of love. And there is so much emotion and power behind this spell that is cast, it actually goes from being a standard spell to becoming a generational curse. Now this is really interesting to me as it does tie back into witchcraft again. Spells cast with strong emotions are often more powerful and they manifest more strongly because we have more emotion, more energy behind it. Many practitioners will cast spells in a highly emotional state. This could be happiness and joy, it could also be sadness and anger, and this emotion can really help fuel our workings. It's one of the reasons why a lot of beginner witches, especially on their first spell, maybe their second spell, if they are doing it with high emotion, will have really strong positive results. And then after that point, if they haven't learned foundational practices, they won't be having as much success. And it's because that highly emotional state has fueled that working with energy that otherwise they aren't aware of how to control yet. 
This is something that can be a positive and a negative. High emotional states in witchcraft can offer powerful results, but they can also sway workings if that emotion isn't controlled. It's a really fine balance. You want to have enough emotion to push that working forwards, but not so much that it sways the outcome. And that is what Maria experiences here. She is so full of rage and sadness that that working essentially adapts itself to fit her needs in the strongest way possible. Now, not only will she never feel the agony of love ever again, but now every single person in that lineage is forced to experience the same fate. Everyone that they love will come to die, and so they will never feel the agony of love because they never have the chance to. It's one of those really twisted workings, and it's why, in actual magical practice, the saying, be careful what you wish for, is really important. We have to make sure that everything that we do, every practice that we carry out, is really thought out, to make sure that we are double-checking, that we are crossing our T's and dotting our I's, to make sure that nothing is going to go astray. We then fast forward in time, several hundred years, to the mother and father of Sally and Gillian Owens. Now, Sally and Gillian are the two that we're going to be focusing on for the majority of this, but this aspect of the movie sets the scene for everything to come. We know about the curse now, and we know about why the curse was cast. This is the moment where we first see it in action. Sally and Gillian are playing on the beach with their mum and dad, and then their mum hears the call of the Death Watch Beetle. Now in the movie, the call of the Death Watch Beetle is described as such, quote, when you hear the sound of the Death Watch Beetle, the man you love is doomed to die. Later that same day, he does die, and eventually she dies of a broken heart. Now, the mythology surrounding the Death Watch Beetle is really interesting, and it's so large that I'd probably have to go into it in a separate video, but essentially, a lot of people believed that hearing the sound of this beetle, which was very common in homes and wooden structures, was said to be similar to the call of the Banshee. Now, the Banshee is part of Irish legend, and it is believed that when you hear the cry, the wail, or the scream of the Banshee, either you or someone you cared about was doomed to die. The Death Watch Beetle is really similar in that regard. For some, it was believed to be the sound of time ticking away for a loved one. For others, it was simply the knocking on the door to say that death was coming. And generally, this comes from a time when people would often hold vigil over the ill, sick, and elderly in their own homes. Usually, these would be wooden structure, and if they weren't wooden structure, they would usually have wooden beams. The call of this beetle comes from the beetle boring into wood, and so it was especially common when holding vigil over a loved one who was close to death that you would hear the sound of the Death Watch beetle. And so it becomes intrinsically linked to death dying illness and the afterlife in a way that other insects aren't quite as closely related. Now even I learned this story when I was a child. I first heard a Death Watch beetle when I was just a child and I was told that if you were to hear the Death Watch beetle it is a sign that someone in the local area was about to die. Now it isn't just about the man you love, that's something that was added in specifically for the movie, but I thought it was really interesting how much of that folklore they did include. Now after the death of both their mother and father, Gillian and Sally move into the home of their aunts, Frances and Jet. This house, by the way, is stunning. Of all of the houses in all of the witchy movies, this one is by far my favourite. It is gorgeous. And it's gone on to become this popular thing in itself, is just the Owens family house. But the aunts are themselves practising witches. And while in their care, the girls begin to learn about witchcraft and what it means to be an Owens woman. While all of this is happening, the local community are aware of the history of witchcraft and they actively bully these young girls into believing that they are terrible people, into believing that who they are is wrong simply because they're different. On this small island, the witch trial accusations have not stopped. And so the young children continue to chant, witch, witch, you're a witch, 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 you're a witch, as a torment, not only to the Owens children as they are now, but also to their children when they start growing up, which is honestly just really heartbreaking. When they arrive at the home, the aunts begin to teach them witchcraft, and they do this from a large, leather-bound, ancient-looking book. 
this is something that we do see for modern witches today. I have several of these myself, perhaps not as large or as fancy and ornate, but at least books that I can write my magical practice down in. Many people call these books of shadows. They are essentially magical journals, vessels for all of our spells, rituals, and practices, so that we can look back on them later and repeat those that have been successful. Now, a lot of practitioners will have their own individual books. These could be physical notebooks, digital notebooks. They might be large, leather-bound tomes, but most practitioners will have at least something to note down their magical practice. If you are in a coven or in a family group, you might find that there is a large collective book of shadows, and this is the kind of one that we see in this scene. These large books are designed to hold all of the rituals for all of the members of the coven that work together. So every group ritual is written down, documented, information is added in, so that if necessary, it can be repeated again. Each individual member is likely to have their own personal books for when they are doing practice outside of the coven, but within the coven, usually a large book is included, and these are often custom made, so if you want one of these books, lots of occult shops and witchy shops will have their own custom books of shadows that they can get hold of in as big a size as you need. There's one shop that I've been to personally, I don't think they've got it anymore, but they did have a giant book of shadows. This book of shadows was massive, it was probably about four foot long, it was huge, and it was designed to to be a coven book of shadows, so I do like that inclusion. The girls are then quickly shooed upstairs as a woman comes banging on the back door of the house, desperate for the aunts to cast a spell for her. The spell that she wants is a love spell, an obsession spell. And while a lot of people within the witchcraft community don't like this kind of spell, I do think it is significant to talk about. This spell includes many aspects, but the thing that's most interesting to me is how Aunt Jet actively tries to dissuade this woman from carrying out this spell. Before the spell is even agreed upon, she says, are you sure that you don't want someone who is better suited? And this woman is adamant that no, she does not want someone better suited, she wants this person. At that point, the aunts give in and they carry out this spell. Now, this is something that we do see within active magical practice as well. If you go to a spellcaster or a witch, it's quite likely that they will in advance be aware of what is likely to work and what is not likely to work, and they will let you know that. So if you go to a witch and they try to actively dissuade you from doing that working, please do not take offense at it. Usually it's because they've done a reading beforehand, they have an idea of how that spell is going to work out, and they know that it isn't going to work out well. And so they'll try to push you in a direction that is better suited for you and the better outcome. In the movie's case, it would be someone who was better suited, rather than forcing someone to fit into a box that they simply don't fit. And yet, the woman refused, and the working continues. This spell does include the harm of an animal, so just be careful with that if you are sensitive to those subjects, but it does show an aspect of practice that most people do not carry out for themselves. There are many traditions, however, around the world that do carry out such practices that is an individual choice. While this seems like a fairly unimportant scene, it's at this moment that the two sisters go in different directions. Gillian decides that love is what she wants more than anything else, whereas Sally decides that she never wants to experience it, having seen the torment that it brought to not only her mother, but the woman sitting right before her. And in order to avoid this love, she casts a spell. Now, counterintuitively, she actually casts a love spell with the specific purpose of tying her to someone that physically cannot exist. And so she goes around the greenhouse collecting different herbs and items that she adds into the spell, and she asks for a series of traits that she believes are physically impossible. Someone who can ride a horse backwards, who loves flipping pancakes, with one green eye and one blue eye, someone whose favourite shape is a star. And she's 11 years old at this point. She doesn't realise that what she's actually asking for is a real person who can exist, but we'll get onto that part later. Her thought, at 11, is that if she does a spell that will tie her to someone impossible to exist, that means that she will never, ever experience the pain of love and the spell is successful. She binds herself to this person that she thinks cannot exist, and then goes about her life thinking that everything is going to be fine. Sally and Gillian are now old enough to move out and leave the island, and Gillian does exactly that. She's running away with a boyfriend so she can have a new life in a new place where no one knows her, but before she leaves Sally, they carry out a blood pact. Now, a blood pact is where you share blood and ritually bind yourself to the other person. This is something, however, that I would definitely dissuade people from doing as it does carry so many medical risks. 
Blood magic, however, is really powerful and many practitioners do use it in different forms. Some people will use normal blood, other people will use menstrual blood. It has really strong connections to us and is often used as a tag lock in spells and rituals, but it can also be used to further power our spells as well. It is, however, something you have to do really, really carefully. Do not put yourself in harm's way to do this. Everything has to be sterile and done in the right way. And if you don't feel comfortable doing it, you don't have to do it. It isn't something every practitioner will carry out. It is just something I thought that I needed to mention, but emphasis here on the fact that this kind of blood pact is incredibly dangerous and it can lead to the spread of disease and it's just something that I would not recommend. Enter into this kind of thing at your own risk and make sure you do your own research. Time moves on and Gillian is enjoying her life away from the island and away from her witchcraft history while Sally is seemingly stuck in a rut. And this is when the aunts begin to meddle their own magic in her life. After a chance encounter with a man called Michael on the street, the aunts cast a love spell on the pair of them. This love spell kicks in at the chime of a bell and immediately the pair are infatuated with one another. This kind of love spell is based on real world practice and it's something that many practitioners will have a lot of ethical issues with, but it's important to note that not all love spells are obsession spells and so we shouldn't demonize an entire style of practice when only a certain section of spells are considered morally questionable. Now this spell leads to their marriage and the ultimate birth of two beautiful daughters. These look almost exactly like Sally and Gillian, which I love the kind of repetition of this trait where one has red hair and one has dark hair. I just really like that just stylistically. I think that's really cool. Now she is happily in love and completely blissed out until one day she wakes up in the middle of the night and she hears the call of the Death Watch Beetle. Now, this is one of the most interesting scenes to me, and I have no idea whether it was intentional or unintentional. I'm going to assume it was intentional because everything else in this movie seems to be. Sally starts ripping up floorboards trying to find this Death Watch beetle, while Michael goes to work as he normally does. He passes a large black Labrador. Now, this might be meaningless to so many people, but having looked into folklore, the Black Shuck is a large black dog that is believed to be an omen of death. If they aren't an omen of death, they're at least present at death or around funerals. Now, this is where I'm not sure if it was intentional or not, because this black dog passes Michael, they make eye contact, you're focusing on this dog for a period of time, and then we see this dog looking in the direction where death is coming from. He's looking as these bikes pass past him, everything we think is fine, and then unfortunately, he meets an untimely end. Now at this point, the Death Watch Beetles go completely silent. Their task has completed. We never see this dog ever again, which is what makes me think it could be a Black Shuck type figure, a secondary omen of death. And then Sally is left alone and heartbroken. In all of her heartbreak and sadness, Sally rushes to the aunt's house and begs them to perform a spell that will bring him back from the dead. Now this is known in fantasy as being necromancy, and it's something that isn't possible in real world magic, though a lot of people do wish it were so. Instead, in real practice, necromancy is the art of communing with the dead, of summoning up a spirit from the grave in order to have a conversation, an interaction of some kind with them, to then be returned back to the grave again after the fact. It is not the actual summoning back from the dead of a living being because sadly, once people have passed over, usually that's where they stay. Now, the aunts flat out refuse to carry this out. Even though Sally knows that it's possible, they completely refuse, and she has to slowly begin to process her guilt. To do this, she moves back in with the aunts, but she swears that her children will never learn witchcraft. And this is the idea of this generational curse, where each generation is going through the same heartbreak, the same things time and time again. Not only did Sally and Gillian have to live with the aunts, now Sally and her children have to live with them too. It's this idea of repeating cycles. From this point onwards, we see a repeating theme where both Sally and Gillian are aware when the other person needs help or when they're thinking of them. So we see that the pair of them will both look at their hands at the scar from that blood pact and be aware that the other person needs help and then we see it later on when the phone rings and Sally and Aunt Jet immediately know that it's Gillian and that she needs help. Now this is something that many people within the witchcraft community and outside of it experience especially with close family members. 
Sometimes you just know that someone needs your help before you even pick up that phone. This could be someone that you've not spoken to in years and all of a sudden the phone is ringing and you instantly know who it is and you know that you need to answer it quickly. This is something I've experienced myself, knowing exactly who's on the other end of the phone before I even look at it, especially when phones were just hung up on the wall and you had to answer them in order to know who it was. This was more commonplace than perhaps now when we can see who it is instantly. Now Sally picks up this phone knowing that Jillian needs help. She's got tangled up in a mess that she cannot get out of with a man who is really, really dangerous. Sally travels essentially halfway across the country to go and get Jillian and bring her home and this is where all of the problems start. Tonight of all nights there is a ring around the moon. While they're there we see this ring around the moon again and Jillian specifically says blood around the moon. It is a very significant and very dangerous omen, at least in this universe. Now, the idea of a ring around the moon is something that we see time and time again. It's in so many different mythologies and folklores around the world, and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing very much depends on your tradition. So I can only go off what I'm experiencing from the rest of this movie so far. The idea of Black Shuck and Death Watch Beatles would allow it to align with the idea that a ring around the moon means change. Now this change doesn't necessarily have to be bad, it could be anything, but we do see that each sister has a different colour ring around the moon, which I thought was incredibly interesting. When Sally looks up at the moon on the island, she sees a white or blue ring, whereas when Jillian looks up at the moon, it's a blood red ring. And this kind of colour symbolism is going to vary tradition to tradition, practitioner to practitioner, with many people seeing the colours as being different. So base your judgement on your experiences. Note down the times when you're seeing a ring around the moon, the colour of that ring, and then judge based off what you experience, how you should perceive each of those colours. For me, white or blue is change that could could be for the better or it could simply be neutral, whereas a red ring around the moon often means sudden change for the negative. And so we're seeing each sister having a slightly different form of change. Both are going to experience it, but they're going to experience it in different ways. Once Jillian sees this blood on the moon, this red ring, she immediately panics and she has to find her tiger eye necklace. Now, Tiger Eye is a stone that is really popular within the witchcraft community. It's used for so many things, primarily for protection, courage, and inner strength, which are all things that Jillian is very much rooted in. This is who her character is. She's incredibly strong through distress, and so it really does link back to her character, which is another one of those instances where it shows the people who created this movie, whether it was originally in the book or simply in the movie, did their research. They knew what they were talking about, which is so refreshing to me. I absolutely love it when movies have all of these little tie backs to real magical practice. Eventually she does find her necklace. Unfortunately, she also finds Angelov, who then kidnaps the pair of them and forces Sally to drive. Now I can't go into too much detail about what's gonna happen here, because I don't think YouTube is gonna like it, but essentially he ends up in the spirit world and they get stuck with his car, and they proceed to carry out a necromantic ritual. The idea being that it doesn't matter how Jimmy comes back, they just need him to have a pulse. And so they attempt to carry out this necromantic ritual, and they're actually successful. The thing with this ritual though that makes it for me is not the ritual itself, despite it being really, really good, it's how chaotic the entire thing is. So you have this big spell book and it has loads and loads of plants included in this ritual and items which are really used in witchcraft, including things like henbane, wheatgrass, as well as mandrake and beeswax candles. These are all things that are included and it only goes to show the severity of this ritual. Henbane and mandrake are really dangerous if used incorrectly. They're also often incredibly incredibly expensive and so it really shows the significance of this working but the chaos of the two sisters is just so accurate to real magical practice. Of course there are many people out there who get everything perfectly sorted for their rituals beforehand, they will have everything laid out, everything pre-prepared and then there are other practitioners, myself included, that halfway through a ritual they'll go, oh I forgot this, oh no I forgot that, where did I put this? I don't think I've got any of that, I need to find a substitute, what can I substitute it for? And so there's panic basically during spells and rituals if we don't have things prepared and in this we see Sally do just that. They need to draw over a pentagram that's been drawn on his chest and they don't have anything to draw over it with so they used whipped cream 
in a spray can, which is just the most genius thing ever. It's a very, I have been growing up with witchcraft my entire life, this is a quick substitution kind of action that really roots, especially Sally, into reality, and it just makes me love her character even more. She is my favourite, by the way, if you hadn't noticed, Sally is my favourite. I would love to know, who is your favourite? Do you prefer Gillian? Do you prefer Sally? Do you think you're more like one than the other? I am much more like Sally than I am like Gillian. Travelling the world and going crazy at parties is not really my thing, but power to her, she really loves it. Anyway, back off the tangent again, that entire ritual does work and it includes so many aspects that are real like the five-pointed star is really significant I'm actually wearing one now this is referred to as a pentacle because it is within a circle but both the pentacle and pentagram are used within witchcraft as well as many other traditions and it works Angelov is back again except he's just as horrible as he was last time so they have to deal with him and then bury him in the back garden and hope that no one comes looking for him which unfortunately is exactly what happens. I forgot to mention as well, during this spell, they also call upon Hecate. Now, Hecate is one of the many goddesses of witchcraft and many practitioners will call upon her today in their spells and rituals. Now, not every practitioner is going to work with Hecate, but some people really enjoy doing that. And so once again, it only shows that they did do their research when they were preparing for this movie, which is a massive thumbs up for me. When they aren't to return from their trip, they know that something is wrong and neither Jillian or Sally are telling them anything. And while they're having this conversation, a broom in the kitchen falls over. Now, brooms are also known as besoms in witchcraft and in Wicca, and they have so much symbolism surrounding them and so many traditions and beliefs. One of the many is that brooms can offer protection. They can also cleanse away unwanted energies and they open up new opportunities and new beginnings. A broom that is kept by the door with its bristles up is believed to offer protection. And if a broom falls, it means one of many things. If a broom just falls, it could mean illness or sickness is about to enter into your life. But if a broom falls by a door, it means company will arrive before the end of the day. And that's exactly what the aunts take this for when this broom falls in the kitchen. And sure enough, we are starting to see visitors of the spirit kind coming through that perhaps shouldn't be coming through. We see the roses over the grave where Angelov is buried begin to grow rapidly. Toads begin appearing in the garden and strange things start happening. Now, when you use plants in spells, sometimes the plant can directly react to the spell that you are carrying out. So if you are doing a protection spell and you tie into it a plant, that plant is going to look different depending on what the energy is like. If there's lots of negative energy in that space that it is absorbing, that plant is going to start getting sick. It is going to start looking all limp and lifeless and changing colours. If that plant is used in a prosperity spell, that is going to bloom and grow as prosperity grows. Now, while that is not directly what is happening in the movie, it is something to take into consideration that they might have been drawing on. The idea idea of unnatural changes when magic is involved is something that we do see both across fiction and reality. Now at this point we've had one of the most famous scenes in the entire movie, that being the Midnight Margaritas, which is just so much fun. Fun. And this is really what's happening at the start of this energy that's coming in. And I do wonder if some of that spirit activity, the broom falling, the bottle appearing on the table that belonged to Angelov, I wonder if all of this perhaps might have been influenced by the high energy of everyone singing, dancing, laughing, talking. It's a really high energy scene. And I don't know if it was intentional, but something in me tells me that perhaps some of that high energy might have impacted the spirit activity and maybe even started to trigger it. At this point though, the aunts decide, hey, if you're not going to tell us anything, sort it out for yourself. So they do exactly that. They take out a box under the stairs that contains some of the hangman's rope that was used on Maria at the very, very start of this movie, and they give a small section to each of the two daughters. Now, this is really significant in folklore because hangings had so much superstition surrounding them. Some of the legends of the mandrake plant and the mandrake root specifically come from the legends of hangings, and it was believed that hangings and interacting with objects and people that were a part of hangings could heal illnesses, could bring good luck, good fortune, abundance, and most importantly, 
protection. It was said that the hangman's rope could offer you protection against evil spirits, which is probably why it was included in this movie as a way of protecting the two young daughters so that they aren't involved in any of the chaos that is about to ensue. At this point, the young daughters start getting more involved. The longer they spend in the Owens house with the aunts, the more their magical abilities are beginning to come to the forefront. And it's something that's unavoidable. As much as Sally would like to stop the girls from practicing their own magic, it isn't something she's really able to do. This is natural for them. And especially with Kylie, we see this more often. She refuses to go and pick Mint outside before school because there's a man standing outside. That man is standing over Angelov's grave, right next to the rose bush that grew overnight. Now everyone rushes to the window to see the man that she's looking at, and no one else can see him. And it's because children and some people are more sensitive to spirits than others, and they might be more likely to see and experience them. We see this a lot. Children are very, very in tune with the spiritual world. They will talk about seeing the fair folk. They will talk about seeing dead relatives that they have never met or seen in their entire life. They will be able to describe their grandparent that died 10 years ago like they were standing right in front of them. And this may be because they're actually seeing them. Over time, however, this ability starts to fade, whether that's something that naturally happens or maybe it's because the world we live in is so opposed to people being able to see spirits and interact with the spirit world. And so a lot of the time, teenagers will push it down in order to make themselves more normal and then as adults it becomes more difficult to redevelop those skills and in this case Kylie seems to be really attuned with the spirit world. This is also the day where we first see Gary. Now Gary is a very interesting character. He's an investigator who's looking into Angelov's disappearance and he begins questioning people, stories aren't quite adding up and he begins tailing especially Sally to figure out what's going on because he thinks that her story doesn't line up with reality. Now, Sally has started her own business. It's something that she and her late husband were going to do and she decides to do it all by herself. And so he comes in and starts watching her work, seeing all of her herbal remedies and her witchcraft in practice. Now, at this point, he starts interviewing the people around Sally to get an idea of what she's doing, why she's doing it, her kind of motives, who she's like as a person. Now, one lady in particular does say the following, which, yes, evil, no. I mean, you get your psychos now and then, you know, animal slaughter, ritual human disembowelment, but that's really pretty rare. See, it's a pagan label, end quote. And I thought this was really interesting. The idea that everyone around Sally kind of has an idea of what's going on, especially the people close to her, even though she's not openly admitted it to anyone. And for many within witchcraft, this is a conversation we have to have regularly. If someone finds out you're a witch or they even consider you a witch, you will get the same question every time. Are you a good witch or a bad witch? Have you ever cast a spell on me? Can you do a reading for me? Can you cast a spell for me? These are all things that people will say when they find out that you are a practicing witch. And so it's almost like this is directly from the mouth of an actual practitioner. Because for the most part, when people ask these questions, it isn't necessarily about telling the whole truth. It's about ensuring that we are safe and protected. Because as much as I'd like to think that things have changed in the last 30 years, people are still accused of practicing witchcraft. And in some cases, they have terrible difficulties because of it. Whether they be social difficulties or whether they be physical attacks because of it, depending on where you live in the world, this is still a pretty big problem. Now, not all witches are pagan. Witchcraft is a secular practice, so it does not contain religion. It is something that you can add to religions if you would like to. So there are many pagan witches, myself included, but you do not have to be a pagan witch in order to be a witch. There are many Christian witches, there are many secular witches, so many options out there. Some people will follow whole pantheons of deities, other people will just pick one or two. It's very varied person to person, but this is very much a copy and paste statement that you would give to someone who was prying, whose intention you didn't quite know, and so you want to make sure that you're staying safe. Gary then essentially invites himself round to breakfast to ask Sally more questions. And while this is happening, Jillian realises this guy is getting too close. He knows that something is wrong. We need to get rid of him. And so she enlists the help of the two daughters in order to make a herbal syrup that will banish him from their lives. Now, this syrup is created with a series of dried herbal ingredients that are ground together and added into a syrup base, which is something that you would do if you were going to be practicing this kind of kitchen witchcraft for yourself. Though obviously in the real world, there are things that we have to take into consideration that a movie probably wouldn't have to. 
So when it comes to kitchen witchcraft, it can be really, really simple, such as stirring tea with a certain intention and you're stirring it clockwise to attract something in and anti-clockwise to remove something. It might be adding some kind of sweetener, whether that be sugar, honey, agave syrup, whatever it is into your tea to improve that circumstance and to make it more beneficial to you. It can be really, really complicated, like having ridiculous blends of herbs that you have specifically created and charged at certain planetary hours in order to add into particular food to manifest a particular intention that you will then eat in ritual circumstances. Like you can go really, really extreme with both ends of it. It can be really, really simple. It can be really, really complex. But one rule of thumb that I personally would always follow, do not add anything into someone's food that they are not expecting, especially if they have the risk of being allergic or having a reaction to it. People tend to throw around the idea that just because it's natural, that means it's safe. But the reality is, is that there are lots of plants out there, lots of herbs, lots of citrus especially, where it will directly interact with people's medication. It can make medication stop working. It can make medication work too much. You can have an allergic reaction from it. You can have a sensitivity to it. And so it's always important that if you are going to do kitchen witchcraft, that you make sure that you're safe about it and that you're not going to risk someone else's safety for the benefit of your working. If in doubt, use a different technique, try a different way. You don't need to be potentially risking someone's safety in order to achieve it. So please don't try and do some banishing syrup on a random person whose medication and allergies you do not know because you risk literally harming them, if not worse. So just bear that in mind. But at this point, the girls realize this investigator, Gary, is not as simple as just being a nosy investigator. He actually can do all of the things that Sally's dream guy from that original love spell is able to do. He can flip pancakes, he can ride a horse backwards, his favorite shape is a star. They're quickly realizing, having found Sally's original spell, that this guy is more. And so they literally throw the syrup and the jug it was in into the ocean, which Littering, let's not throw stuff into the ocean, but it is a really funny scene in the movie. While at the house, Gary does what he said he was going to do. He interviews Sally again. And this time a few really poignant things are said, especially by Sally, which show the mindset to the witchcraft community during this time period in the late nineties. Now he's essentially sharing with her the things that the townsfolk have said. And he mentions the fact that some people in the town believe that they are worshiping the devil. And Sally responds with quote, no, there's no devil in the craft, end quote. Now this was a really popular belief during this time period. Essentially from the revival of witchcraft in the 50s, we see this idea and this separation of witchcraft from anything that is perceived as being negative. This continued all the way up into the 2000s, even the 2010s, we still had this idea that witchcraft was completely separate from anything that could potentially be perceived as less than positive. And yet today we know that this isn't true. Witchcraft is secular. And while many people don't work with the Christian devil, there are going to be some practitioners who do. They don't speak for everyone, just as I don't speak for everyone. Everyone is completely unique in their practice. And because of the secular nature of witchcraft, it can be attached to any deity and any religion and basically anything, as long as they work well together. So many people will be witches and they will also follow the Christian faith or the Christian God. Many people are witches and they will work with saints. Many people are witches and don't believe in any deities. Some will work with set deities. Some will work with pantheons of deities. Some will work with the Christian devil and others will work with figures that are the origin of the Christian devil. When you actually look at the history of the devil, he doesn't appear until much later than a lot of the other information about Christianity. And that's quite likely because he was based off pre-existing figures, characters, deities, of people that needed to be converted to Christianity. It's much easier to convert someone to a religion if you are using figures that they recognize and then twisting them for a purpose. Now we aren't sure if this is exactly what's happened, but there are lots of pre-existing deities that are very similar to the Christian devil in their appearance, but not necessarily in their behavior. This includes figures such as Keronos, Hearn, and Pan. I myself follow Keronos as one of my deities, and so I would be perceived as being 
a devil worshipper if people were to simply see the figure of one of my deities and take it at face value. It's also important to remember that within certain branches of traditional witchcraft, the witch's devil is a figure who also very much resembles the Christian devil without having a lot of the negative connotations that surround it. So that is really important to bear in mind. It is not that no one worships the devil, but more that it's complicated. And there's a lot of history there, and there's a lot of adapting of history to suit specific goals that might not actually be traditional to the original use of that figure and the worship of that figure. And that's just really important to bear in mind. During this conversation, Sally also tries to explain her practice a little bit further. And she says, quote, magic isn't just spells and potions. Your badge, it's just a star, just another symbol, your talisman. It can't stop criminals in its tracks, can it? It has power because you believe it does, end quote. This was in reference to Gary's badge, which is a star, which as mentioned before, is a protection symbol in many different traditions, including witchcraft. And it's this idea that trying to explain witchcraft to someone who simply doesn't get it, who's not interested in it, who doesn't believe in it, it's always gonna sound like nonsense, right? You can cast a thousand spells, but if you don't believe that what you're doing is going to do anything, it's not going to do anything. Whereas it is about having that deep intrinsic belief in something. Christians will pray because they believe that praying will do something. And for many Christians, it does. The same applies to witches and to people who utilize magical arts. This goes beyond just witchcraft, by the way. Witchcraft is just one magical art. There's so many others. The intrinsic belief in something gives it power. And then when we direct that power in a specific direction, we manifest change. It's not just repeating spells out of a textbook and making potions out of a recipe. It's more about your perception of it, your deep connection to it. Just like his connection to his badge is powerful, so is hers to her magic. And this is something that we do see repeated later on. At this point, Sally realizes she has to do the right thing. She already can't tell Gary a lie and it's something that's messing up their entire plan of lying about what happened to Angelov and so she decides she's going to confess so she does just that she goes all the way into town finds where he is and essentially confesses everything to him at this point she realizes he isn't just an investigator he has one green and one blue eye and this is where her world starts just falling apart around her and here we have another one of those moments of knowing something is wrong without realizing what it is she knows that something is wrong with jillian and so she rushes back to the house to find that she has been possessed by the spirit of angelov now, spirit possession does exist in the real world, but it is not a regular occurrence. It's actually really rare to happen. It takes a whole lot of energy and the person that has to be possessed often has to be really weakened. We do see this in the movie. Jillian is really struggling. She's struggling to hold herself together with the lies. She's struggling with the stress of the entire situation. She's just finding it really difficult and that has given an opening for Angelov. Now, there's lots of ways that we can do this. Banishing spells are most common within witchcraft. Within certain religions, you do see exorcism being used as well, though generally you would start small and then work up from there in order to fix the issue. But a lot of people are scared of possessions. They are very, very rare in the grand scheme of things. It takes a very powerful spirit and a very weakened person in order for this to happen. And even so, usually the attachment isn't super strong. Angelov then comes out of Jillian and attempts to attack Gary, who has essentially followed Sally home because he also knows something is wrong. Angelov reaches through his chest chest and his hand hits the star on his badge and it burns a hole in his hand. I'm not going to be able to show you the clip of this because it is gruesome, but it fully burns his hand and that's the moment when he realizes, hang on, Sally was right. I believe that this has power, therefore it does. And it's that really symbolic moment that we're seeing there. He believes that this action has burned away Angelov's spirit and that they're all safe but they couldn't be further from the truth. A lot of the time, actions like this are done to disturb a spirit. So they may temporarily separate a spirit from that which they have attached onto, whether that is a person or an object. They dissipate temporarily, and this is the point where you need to put protections up. You need to cleanse and protect to stop them from reattaching. In this instance, however, that isn't done. And so they believe that Angelov's spirit is gone when actually he has simply been temporarily dislodged and he's about to come back really, really hard. The aunts rush back home thinking they've got back in time, but Jillian is already repossessed. 
and they realize that this is really bad. This is much worse than they were expecting and they are quite scathing about it, honestly. They say, quote, this is what comes from dabbling. You can't practice witchcraft while looking down your nose at it. And this is actually really true in the real world as well. It's really difficult to successfully practice witchcraft and safely practice witchcraft. If you're constantly saying that witchcraft is nonsense, that witchcraft is stupid, that you don't understand why people do it, you wanna prove that it works, but you don't actually have any faith in it, this is how things go wrong. Either that working is not gonna manifest because you are directly sabotaging it with the things that you are saying and the fact that you aren't working your energy efficiently. And the other thing that can go wrong is that you are not taking it seriously. You are not taking any of the risks seriously either, which can lead to further problems. Essentially, practicing witchcraft turns a light on in the dark. A little bit like moths to a flame, you're going to attract things that are curious. And if you think that witchcraft is nonsense, and you think it's stupid, and you don't want to do anything to keep yourself safe, you are putting yourself in harm's way. This is why so many practitioners tell beginners, if you are going to practice witchcraft, start from the ground up. It's much easier to build a practice on a solid foundation than building a practice on no foundation and then having to fix it after the fact. It's much easier to just get it right in the first place. Having looked at Jillian though, they realize that they are not gonna be able to do this by themselves. Angelov is way, way too strong and Jillian is far too weak for this. And so they need more people. So the aunts are having this conversation while looking at Jillian saying, we have to banish him, force his spirit back to the grave. We need a full coven, nine women, 12's better. Now this is true in real practice. You do not need to be part of a coven if you don't want to be, but there's definitely benefits to it. One person has to raise a lot of energy to do a big spell, but a coven of people, each individual has to raise a smaller amount of energy to have a lot more energy collectively than one person ever could. It means that if you are getting started, if you are not super adept at energy work, you can work with others to raise more energy with less effort to then direct towards a working. Through this entire movie, they are referring to witches as being women. I think it's important for me to emphasize that the term witch is gender neutral. You do not have to be a woman in order to practice witchcraft. Anyone can learn to practice witchcraft. It is a craft, it is a skill. Now, some covens will be gender specific. Other covens are open to absolutely everyone. So if you are interested in joining a coven, usually the most important thing is that you vibe with the group, not only emotionally and with personality, but also with energy as well, because you want everyone to be cohesive. There are definitely groups out there that are gender specific, but the majority of them will be mixed just as long as everyone gets on. Now they don't have a coven. With Jillian possessed, there's only three of them. And so they call upon all of the women in the town that have bullied them their entire lives to help them with this working, which I understand the intention behind it, right? I get it. It's all about bringing people together, people removing their misconceptions, removing the stereotypes, accepting people for who they are, being open-minded, all of that kind of stuff, I get it. But when you've just told off Sally and Jillian for dabbling in witchcraft and not knowing what they're doing and looking down their noses at it, you are then inviting a group of women who actively don't like you, who don't believe in what you're doing and don't like what you're doing and who have bullied you your entire life. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say to that. That just seems like a tremendously bad idea, but they do it anyway. All of the women bring a broomstick well, one of them brings a vacuum cleaner, but she tried. That gives me Hocus Pocus vibes, you know, where the Sanderson sisters have all lost their brooms because the children have stolen them. And so they raid a cupboard and there's one broomstick, one mop and one vacuum cleaner. <laughs> That's kind of the vibe I'm getting from this, but they all have to stand in a circle and hold the brooms tip to tail, basically. So top to bottoms all the way around to form a circle. Now, at this point, the women have already bonded a little bit. They've shared their experiences. A lot of them have witchy experiences experiences without even realizing it and it does just emphasize as it does in the real world that many of the things that we experience in witchcraft don't have to be directly linked to witchcraft so you can have premonitions you can have these ideas that someone needs help and not knowing why without choosing to practice witchcraft it is simply something that you might experience that you might want to work with you might want to include into your witchcraft but it isn't a requirement so all the ladies are gathered around and then the chanting starts 
Now this is done in, I believe, Latin, which is one of those languages that we see commonly used in movies and TV shows to represent a witchcraft language. And it's done that way to add a little bit of extra mysticism into the entire thing. And many practitioners will do it today. What I will say is if you want to do your workings in a different language, make sure you know that language. Google Translate doesn't count because Google Translate is not particularly good at getting words in the right order. And you might end up saying something that you don't actually intend to say. So if you want to do something in Latin, make sure that you know Latin. If you want to do something in Spanish, make sure that you know Spanish. This is useful if you are working with spirits, for instance, where English perhaps is not their native language. If you want to do that spell in their native language, then do that. Do what makes you feel comfortable. Don't force yourself to work in English either if you aren't comfortable working in English. Use your preferred language. Just make sure that whatever you're using, you understand what you're saying. Now, as this chanting is going on, it goes from the aunts to a few members of the group, to every member of the group chanting. And this idea comes from actual witchcraft. The raising of energy by chanting has been done for a very, very long time. And sometimes this also brings about trance states as well. So you would choose a set phrase or a few words to repeatedly chant again and again and again. And everyone chanting it at the same time in the same way really helps to raise that energy that you can drive into that spell. Not only that, but if you're trying to enter into a trance-like state, you might want to also include walking around that circle in a particular way. Usually this is done clockwise or anti-clockwise, dancing or just walking in a set beat. And you would do this while chanting. And over time, the words become meaningless. They simply become noise and you can drop into a trance-like state. So it's incredibly useful in that regard. And that's kind of how it's being used in this. Everyone is raising that energy so that everyone there even if they don't practice witchcraft themselves, is able to contribute to that working. The goal here is the individuals who are practicing are utilizing the magnified energy of the collective to direct into that working to make it more powerful. When everything is done and dusted, you're gonna have to watch the movie to figure out what happens. They sweep away Angelov's ashes outside and then they tip a potion over the grave to seal him inside it forever. And it is just such a sad satisfying scene when they're pouring the liquid and the grave just like sinks. Oh no, there's something about it that I just love. And then we get to probably the most famous part of this movie, full stop. Everyone's got a happy ending. And then at the very end, Sally says, quote, always throw spilled salt over your left shoulder, keep rosemary by the garden gate, plant lavender for luck and fall in love whenever you can. And this is the most iconic line. It is akin to we are the weirdos mister from the craft. It is that kind of iconic. It's on everything. If you just look at practical magic, this quote will be like the first thing you see. And this is based in a lot of tradition as well. So the idea of spilled salt is that salt is a protective agent. It is a cleanser. But if you spill it and you waste it, it brings about bad luck. And so by taking that salt and tossing it over your left shoulder, you are reversing the action of giving yourself bad luck and you are balancing everything out. So it isn't that you are giving yourself good luck. It is that you are no longer going to be experiencing bad luck. But the reason whether it's left shoulder or right shoulder, really no one knows. It's quite likely simply due to the fact that most people are right-handed and so automatically you would pinch the salt with your right hand, throw it over your left shoulder instead of doing that. But there might be more to it that is simply being lost to time. No one's really sure. So give it a try either way. If you're left-handed, try throwing it over your right shoulder. Give it a go, see what works. But that is a really old tradition. I mean, people in England still do that today. If you knock over like a salt shaker on a restaurant table, you will throw salt over your shoulder. It is just something that is still done. Rosemary is also a really magical plant used for so many different intentions and is often grown on properties specifically because it has a lot of protection, new beginnings, new opportunities, focus, good luck, all of these things that we might want to magnify in our lives. Lavender, just the same, incredibly powerful. It is used in gentle love. It's used in gentle healing. It's used in sleep, dream magic, as well as protection magic. Lots of options. It also smells amazing, as does rosemary and both can be used in kitchen witchcraft. Honestly, this movie is something else. I love it. I have seen it like three times in the last week. I will happily watch it 
10 more times. It is fantastic. And every time I watch it, I see something different. I would love to know if you saw anything in this that I did not see, because this is not everything in the movie. These are just the biggest points that I wanted to highlight the most. There is so much more to it. Do let me know, and I'm sure others would love to know as well. If you did enjoy this video, feel free to give it a like. It means a lot to me. I have other videos in this series. I will leave them linked in the description box and also up here in the top corner. If you do want to check out The Craft as well as The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, they will all be in that playlist. Are there any other movies or TV shows about witchcraft that you would like me to cover? Feel free to let me know in the comment section. I have a few already on my list that I'm going to be working towards, but I'd love to know any extras that you would like me to do. If you did make it all the way through to the end of this video, give yourself a pat on the back because this was a crazy long video and do leave me some flower emojis in the comment section and I will try to heart as many of them as I can because I love interacting with anyone who watches but especially those who stick it out all the way to the very end. Your support genuinely means so much to me. If you do enjoy the magical content on this channel in this video, feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week and with that being said, I hope you're staying safe. I hope you have a marvelous magical day and I will see you in the next video. Bye! Hello. Um, my next door neighbor is having carpet fitted, so, um, it's been like this all day of just like the constant banging from next door, and there's basically nothing I can do about it. I have to film today, today is the only day I can film, so I apologize if you can hear just ding 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 silence, ding 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 ding, it's because they're having carpet fitted, so, um, I can only hope that it's finished quickly but unfortunately I think the room next to me is the last room to be done. I'm also wearing the most practical magic-y top that I could find. I've watched this movie so many times. <coughs> My voice is also still kind of gone. I've watched this movie so many times in the last week or so for this video and I'm completely obsessed. I'm so tempted to actually get my hair cut like Sally is. Sandra Bullock's hair in that movie is just amazing like the way it looks i love the layering i like the cut you don't care i care though <laughs> i just decided you know what we're going to embrace the practical magiciness we've got like the cute the cute bell sleeves we're going for it today and i just have to hope that this doesn't pop open because this is being held on by the smallest the smallest little straps in the middle um so here's to hoping that that doesn't just come off Okay, what was I doing? I was meant to do something. Um, I was meant to sit down, check that this was working, and then go and do something. And then come back. And I've forgotten what that something was. I didn't change that light. I'm too far in now. I'm too far in, I'm not gonna change it but we're just gonna have to hope it's fine. That's what I needed to do. I said I needed to do something. I needed to get the remote control for that light to turn it down, but I've already started filming, so I think we're just gonna have to deal with the light being as it is and hoping that it's fine. Here is what this looks like, by the way. Um, an, an example, right? This is my script for today. <laughs> it, it's all time stamped for the different locations in the movie. So we start at like one minute 29 and then go all the way to the end. Um, Yeah, um, I'm still going, still. I'm only an hour in. Still going, still, still. One hour 20. One hour 39, and the bottom. <laughs> this was massive. Um, I might have bitten off more than I can chew with this one. I knew it was going to be intense. I knew it when I watched it the first time. Um, this is really intense, so. I hope you enjoyed it. I really, really hope you enjoyed it. And at some point, the, um, the carpet fitters left. So the rest of the video was pretty quiet. So the intro might have been a little bit noisy, but the carpet fitters did leave, so yeah. Okay, what time is it? It is 4.15. I was really hoping I'd be able to film another video, but I also have to eat and I have to leave by like 6 p.m. I don't think I'm gonna be able to eat and leave by 6 p.m. and film a video. I'm gonna be honest, because my videos are not, they are not quick. It will be like, at least an hour to film another video. That's 5.15, that gives me 45 minutes to eat, cook, eat, and be ready to go. I don't know, we'll see. We'll see. Mm -hmm.